we're talking about revival, there's something in my spirit today I want to share with you. If you'll turn your Bibles to uh, Joel chapter 2, verse 28. Joel chapter 2, verse 28. Today is where we're going to go. Joel chapter 2, verse 28. I'm going to preach to you for the next few moments. If you'll help me preach today, I want to preach on what I've, I've titled the sermon today, The Conditions. The Conditions. I believe God wants to pour out his spirit on us, but I believe there's some conditions. Uh, now, see, po folks want you to talk about him pouring out his spirit, but they don't want to talk about no conditions. We want God to do something, but we don't want to talk about what it's going to take. But I want, you to, I want you to notice clearly today, and if you will, I want you to hang with me for just a few moments. I want to get your undivided attention because I believe today is very crucial. Very, uh, the timing, the season, the moment is, is right for God to pour out his spirit on us, but we got to be ready for it. we got to be prepared for it. In, in any great awakening throughout the history of the church, there's always been a season of preparation for a move of God. There's always been a time and a season where the church prepared for God to move. Prayer always, uh, revival always came on the wings of prayer and praise. It always came as people were seeking God and, and they were dealing with themselves and the issues of their heart. God always would send an awakening, a stirring, can I say to you, ladies and gentlemen, I want you to hear me closely. Listen to your pastor for just a moment. Let me say this to you before I get into this. As, as I'm, I'm, I'm a little bit older. And a little bit wiser. Now, my wife, is. I married her when she was five. So she's not anywhere close to where I am, all right? So y'all just, you know, she's, she's 29 now and holding it. And so, <laughs> but uh, of course, the thing about that is, you know, I could tell somebody that they'd believe it, amen, with her, because she does. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm, amen. But I want to say I'm a little wiser, a little older. And let me tell you, thank you so much for all the expressions of love. Thank you for every phone call, every text message, every Facebook post, post Twitter post, Instagram, wherever you put it, every gift that was given, every handshake, every neck hug. Every expression of love on my 50th birthday. Isn't that something? Amen. Amen. And I'm, I, listen, I, I want, I'm going to go ahead and tell you I'm totally good. It's all right. It's great. It's great to be 50. I finally arrived. I'm here, y'all. You know what I'm saying? I'm, I'm, I'm to the age. I'm getting a little wisdom sprouting out up on my hair, in my head. I'm covering up a little wisdom in my beard. Come on, somebody. And, uh, but it's okay. I'm, I'm, I'm good with where I am in life today. I'm thankful for it. I'm thankful for this season. I was telling my wife, I'm thankful for a season of being able to, it's, at some point in time, here's somebody call me granddad. You know what I'm saying? Grandpa. You know, this, I told my wife, I said, I'm at the place right now. I'm so good with it. You know, some people have a problem with them calling them certain granny and grandpa and all that. You know, I'm at the place. I don't care what they call me. Just call me. You know what I mean? I want them grandbabies to call me, you know? And so that's, I know that's on the way and that's coming and I'm, we're not rushing things, but it is on the way. It's going to come and they're going to, they're going to have, you know, and they're going to, we're going to, we're going to be grandparents and we're going to spoil them good. Amen. And my children are going to begin to reap what they have sown. And so, uh, and so uh, I'm on. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to spoil them real good and send them home with their daddies. Amen. And say, oh, go home, give your daddy a fit. Ask for what I bought you. Ask for 10 times more when you get home. and Because uh, that's what your daddy would have done. Amen. And now uh, I'm messing with you. But I, we, are, we are excited. I'm, I'm thankful to all of you that participated. Every person that participated in the, in the, in the, in the party. Thank you for that. Every meal that was cooked. Everybody that put it together. You guys done a great job. Thank you for If you had any part in that, stand up and let me just love on you a minute. Amen. If you had any part with anything and putting it together and anything and helping out and serving and doing all that, give them some love. Come on, somebody. Give them some love. Let them know you appreciate them. Amen. Stacy had part in that. Pastor Kyle had part in that. But all my staff, staff, stand up. I love you guys. Thank God for you. Let them know we appreciate them. Thank you, all the staff. Thank you, guys. All the Everybody that did anything, thank you so much. And, and especially thank you to the love of my life, the bride of my youth. Let me tell you something. This is a fact, y'all. I got this woman when she was 19 years old. Amen. 
and it's taken her all these years to train me. <laughs> you know, when I, when I married her, I thought it was going to take me all them years to train her. Then I wised up. Amen. And no matter how much I might feel like I'm the boss, my boys remind me constantly who the boss is. Amen. And then, uh, but it, so uh, they know when they want something, they got to call their mama. Amen. And they, you know, they just, she's just going to fight for them and that kind of thing. And, but I, I am so thankful for her and for her support. And she's been right here with me, y'all, for 20, almost 27 years. We've been in here. So, and so I'm thankful. She showed up and showed out. And, and, uh, and I tell you what, the best is yet to come. Amen. I'm talking about in the future. I'm talking about today sometime. Come on, somebody. Y'all can, y'all can take that however you want to. Amen. I'm going home with her. Amen. Anyway, let me get back to preaching. I'm sweating. Amen. Joel 228. <laughs> I'm 50. I ain't dead, y'all. Amen. Ah. Joel 228. <laughs> Hallelujah. I'm married. Hey. Yeah. I got license. Amen. It's legal, praise God. <laughs> and and can y'all stand? We're gonna get ready to pray. And no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Go home. <laughs> y'all was ready. Y'all were going with me. Y'all were working with me, wasn't you? Amen. <laughs> Joel two twenty eight. Please stand for the reading of God's word. Let's get back together. Amen. Mm -hmm. Some of y'all can, y'all can start smiling now. Some of y'all, I was talking about my wife, not my girlfriend. Well, I was talking about my girlfriend because she's my girlfriend too. Amen. Hallelujah. I'm going to take her out this afternoon. Amen. Joel 2.28. Let's look what the scripture says. And it shall come to pass afterward. Notice that word afterward. It shall come to pass afterward. Everybody say afterward that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh and your sons and daughters shall prophesy. My God, I feel the Holy Ghost right now. And your sons and daughters shall prophesy and your old men shall dream dreams and your young men shall, shall see visions. Boy, I feel the presence of God in this room right now. Hallelujah. Your old men will dream dreams and your young men will see visions. I like the New Living Translation uh, because it says this, then, everybody say then. Then then makes what's going to be said afterwards conditional. Then makes it conditional. Then after doing all those things, after, everybody say after, after. doing all those things, I'll pour out my spirit upon all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams. Your young men will see visions. Notice what he said. He said after, after these things have been done, there's something that has to transpire and take place before there's a move of God. There's, a, there's something that ha, ha, has to happen in our, my life and in your life, in the lives of God's people, in the body of Christ. There's things that have to take place and have to transpire before there's a move of God. And can you say amen to the reading of God's word? If you're going to help me preach today, put your Bible on your seat and give God a big hand clap if you're going to help me preach. Come on. Listen closely. There is an old Chinese proverb that says, he who would take a thousand steps must take the first one. He who would take a thousand steps must take the first step. It starts with the first step. Before there can ever be a step two or step three or step four or step five in any process, there must be a step one. And when we look at this passage of scripture, we begin to understand that there is a step one. We understand that there is something that transpires prior to the outpouring of the spirit of God. He who would take a thousand steps must first take one. When you look at this passage of scripture in its entirety, when you look at it in its entirety, or if you will, in its context, you notice that there are some things that must happen prior to young men uh, uh, having visions and old men having dreams and there being an outpouring of the Spirit of God. There's something that must take place first. 
And, and, and so there, there's some conditions that must be met. As I look at the entirety of the passage of Scripture and I look at every verse, there are two verses that stand out uh, that to me are the most uh, important verses of all the chapter. Oftentimes we find ourselves quoting uh, Joel 2.28, but there's some verses that tie themselves to 28 that makes 28 come to pass and makes it possible. And so there are two verses that I want us to look at specifically today. And that the first verse is, I want us to look at verse number 12. The Bible said, there also now saith the Lord, therefore also now saith the Lord, turn ye even to me, watch this, with all your heart. Everybody say with all your heart. Uh, where, wherever a man's heart is, that's where he is. Whoever has a man's heart, they have him. A, a man's, uh, it, it, it's from the heart that man is, it, it, his passions, his desires flow from his heart. Hello. He said, turn ye even to me with all your heart and with fasting and with weeping and with mourning and rend your heart and not your garments. Turn unto the Lord your God for, for he is gracious and merciful. Notice this, the Lord's gracious. Y'all need to understand that he's full of grace. And he's full of mercy. He's merciful. God wants to have mercy on you. God wants you to have revival. God wants there to be a move of God in this church. He wants you to be blessed. He wants you to walk in the fullness of everything he has for you. God wants that for you. That is the heart of God. God's heart is not to pour judgment on you. God's heart is not to, to wipe you out, no matter what anybody says. God is a just God. He's not going to allow you to continue to turn his, your back on him. But God, his grace is sufficient, and his mercy is new every morning. Amen. He's slow to anger, the Bible said. He's great in kindness. God wants to be good to you. And it, and it repenteth him of the evil. Now, this is what I need you to understand. As you look closely at verse 12, therefore also now saith the Lord, turn ye even to me with all your heart. You see, God is wanting us to turn to him with our hearts today. The problem we have within the church now is, is, is that we're, our heart has been turned away from God. I want to ask you a, an all-important question, and I want you to hear it. And in your own minds and in your own hearts, I want you to answer it. How can we hold God to his part or his word when we haven't been obedient in doing our part? How is it that we want to hold God every day to his word? We want to hold God every day to what he says. We want to hold God every day to the pouring out of the Spirit, the healing, the signs, the wonders, the miracles. We want God to do what he didn't do, but we don't do our part. Well, how is it? It's not a fair thing when we're expecting God to do something supernatural and powerful for us, but we're not willing to do what it is that we need to do to honor God. Well, I came to preach today. Is, is it, what, what, what's wrong with this, this, this whole picture? There is these conditions that must be met. He said, turn to me now while there's time. Give me your hearts. Come with fasting. Come with weeping. Come with mourning. He said, notice what he said. He said, give me your heart. You see, this is what I need you to understand, ladies and gentlemen. We have to realize our hearts have wandered from God. They've wandered from God. Our, the passion that we once had is not there. The desire that we had for God is not there. It's been clouded by earthly things. It's been clouded by earthly desires. It's been clouded by what Paul warned of that would take place in the last days that men would become lovers of themselves and they would become lovers of pleasure more than they are lovers of God. We have a day when men, we're, we're, we're caught up with, with it, it, it's, it's all about going to the lake. It's all about going to the beach. It's all about going to the ball game. It's all about getting, doing this. It's all about that. It's all about the pleasure. My God, I mean, it's all, and everything is all about entertainment. 
I mean, I'm just amazed at, at, at how technology continues to change. I mean, you know why technology is changing so rapidly? Because it's trying to keep up with the, uh, the, the, this, this awesome and this huge desire for pleasure that men have. It puts a, str a strain on, 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 on technology leaders to try to come up with something new to try to entertain a group of people that are all about being entertained. Let me give you an example of what I'm talking about. I believe it or not, in my day as a young child, I remember the day when you had to get up, walk across the room, and manually turn the television. There used to be a day when, when, when you got a colored television. You were blessed. I mean, where it was in color. <laughs> Y'all don't know nothing about that. And then all of a sudden, somebody came up with this awesome idea to, to invent this thing called the remote control. And you could sit in your TV, you could sit in your, on your couch or in your lazy boy and you could hit that button. And it used to be one of them things about a little box like that had that button that clicked when you hit it down. You remember? You hit that click, 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 and finally the clicker would tear up. You'd have to go back to turning it manually again. But, you know, I remember when it came, it was the most awesome thing. And then, and then they came, you know, it changed the color and then they came up with the console television. That thing that went, was on the ground and even they made, M Melissa and I bought one when we really got, you know, started making a little bit of money. You know what I'm talking about? When we were really blessed. Hallelujah. We went and found us one of them consoles that swivel. So if you're sitting on that side of the room. Come on now. It was one of them big jobs that was about this deep and about this long and it'd take about five men to move it to the other side of the living room. You know what I'm saying? But it was something else. I saw a TV the other day. It looked like a sheet of paper. It's all this technology and, and it, it wasn't good enough that we had, that, that they came up with something called high definition. Now high definition is not good enough. You bought a high definition six months ago thinking you had the latest thing. Now it ain't the latest thing anymore. Now it's UHD. UHD 4K smart TV. <laughs> I saw that smart TV walk right by it. They said, that's not for me. That's for smart people. Amen. Let me get me another one. But I walked into Sam's the other day and saw this television hanging up and, and it, the picture was so clear and so bright that you felt like you could step into the picture. I said, man, I got to have me one of them. And then I looked down at the price. I said, huh, where's my console TV at? My God, that television costs more than my little red car I drive around all week. My little red car's paid for. I ain't taking out no loan, no, no 20 year mortgage for no television. I can't get no help up in here. That thing, $5,000 for a TV, really? Man, I don't need to watch TV that good. But see, that's where we are. We're at a level of entertainment because we have to continuously feed this thing that's within us. I'm, I was reading in, in, in a book by Leonard Ravenhill, who was one of the great revivalists many, many years ago. But he, and he wrote a book called Revival Praying. And in Revival Praying, he made this statement. You see, this is what I, I need you to understand. Jesus said, but before I share this with you, Jesus said this, or, or, the, or, or the Lord said this to the prophet Joel. He said, give me your heart. What we have to realize is our hearts have wandered from God. Leonard Ravenhill says this. He said, he said, we have more appetite for material food than we do for spiritual. We have more appetite for material and, 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 and for uh, natural food and physical food than we do for spiritual food. Somebody say, tell me, tell me tell, what you mean, Pastor. I ain't got to tell you what I mean. We got about 12 different channels on your television about food. Food network. Man, you know who, y'all know that, you know, you got that, that guy that comes on there with that hair that sticks up, used to stick up like mine, got that one. guy, you know, it's all about food. And they go in these places all around the country where they, and they try to find hamburgers that are stacked like this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
But you see, it's all about food because we're more interested in physical food than we are in spiritual food. Yeah. Revival is far from us because our hearts are somewhere else. Yeah. I can't get a witness in this church today. Our hearts are away from God. He said we're more, we have more appetite for material food than we do spiritual food. He said we enjoy the company of men more than we enjoy the company of God. We take for granted the presence of God, the power of God, the anointing of God. What's wrong with most of us in this church today is we take for granted that the church will be here in six weeks from now when I decide to come back. We take for granted that God is always going to be there when I need him. And so we, we've created a generation. That's why we stand in the place, and I told the first service today, that's why we're at the place in our society where we have these people that we always joke about and we always say, okay, those folks are the, church, are the people that go to church on Christmas and Easter. Well, you, it, it's not just a ritual for them. I want you to understand there is something spiritual involved. They're still coming at Christmas time just to make sure God's still here. They're coming at Easter time because they still want to make a connection with God. One thing about people, they can say they don't believe in God. They can say all these kind of things, but when it comes down to it, they still want to make sure God's there. Right. Don't leave God. Right. Whatever you do, don't leave me, Lord. Right. You know what I'm saying? You see, we enjoy the company of men more than we enjoy the company of God. He said we love to play more than we love to pray. That's, that's the way it is. We become a, a, a generation that is lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. And see, the absence of prayer will result in the absence of presence. Because the only way the presence of God is coming is on the wings of somebody praying. When the early church began to pray, suddenly there came a sound. When the early church began to pray, suddenly there was an earthquake. When the early church began to pray, thousands came to God. When the early church began to pray, miracles started happening. When the early church began to pray, people were healed. When the early church began to pray, cities were shaken by the power of Almighty God. If you want the presence of God, where are the prayer warriors? That's what's wrong right now. We don't have revival like we used to have because we don't have people praying like we used to have praying. I'm trying to find somebody that realizes that your anointing is not to preach. Your anointing is to pray. Where are the people that will grab hold, as they used to say, of the horns of the altar and hang on to God until we hear from God. We have, you see, we have, we have this love for, for pleasure. We have this love to play, but we do not have a love to pray. There is a price to pay for the anointing of God. There is a price to pay for the presence of God. There is a price, and it's, and it's, it's the place of prayer. Where are the people that will pray? Where are the intercessors? I'm not talking about somebody that prays, and, and five minutes after they start praying, they're bored to death. No, I'm talking about somebody that can get in a prayer closet and enjoy being in the presence of God. Somebody that calls out their, their, their children's name calls out their uncle's and their aunt's name, calls out their neighbor's name, calls out their boss's name, calls out their pastor's name, calls out their friend. I'm, oh, I'm trying to find somebody with a prayer anointing today that knows how to get in touch with God. We need to hear from heaven this morning. We need to hear from God. We have an appetite for, for physical, for the flesh, but no spiritual appetite. We enjoy everybody's company but the company of God. We love all this playing, but we don't love to pray. But then I began to look deeper. And I saw something in verse 13 that really stood out to me that I believe that, that we need to hear as religious people today. You, so, you, you say, Pastor, what, what do you mean religious people? I, that's what we become. The church has become religious. Can I tell you that in the face of trying to be cutting edge and trying to be a church that's not like the, the church. You see, listen, we have not changed the tradition and the religiosity. We just put a new face on it. 
You see, modern churches want to want, want, want to to claim that they're that they're not religious like the early church was. They don't adhere to the but 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 see what we traded in is we traded in for that we traded in the the hairstyles and we we traded in the long skirts and, and we traded in all the other things for lights and and for camera and for action. That's what we traded in. We we've, we've taken on the technology, and, but but we still are without the presence of God. Because religion is man-made. Religion means we'll stir up a move of God by, the, by, by, more, by more technology. If we can get bigger screens and, and we can get bigger lights and we can have greater technology and greater sound, then we'll have a, that, that's when revival's gonna come. Revival only comes at the sound of a group of people that its hearts are turned toward God, praying to the Lord. When our hearts are turned to him, God will send revival. I'm here to preach today. I didn't come to preach for, 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 for response. I didn't come to preach for agreement. <laughs> the word, I came to preach the word of the Lord. In verse 13, there's something interesting here. Don't lose me. Follow what I'm about to tell you. The scripture says, don't tear your clothing in your grief. This is new, tri- new living. Don't tear your clothing in grief, but tear your hearts instead. Hear that. Don't tear your clothing. Tear your hearts instead. There's a reason why he says this. Return to the Lord your God, for he's merciful, compassionate, slow to anger, and filled with unfailing love. He's eager to relent and not punish. You see, the reason he says this, that this quote is very interesting. Now listen to me, follow me. The reason he says that you are to, not to tear your clothing, but tear your heart instead, he's dealing with religion. He's dealing with religiosity. Because if you understand the Jewish culture, you understand Jewish customs, and you understand, the, 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 especially when you start talking about those that got into deep pharisaical uh, religion, when they become so, so deep in religion that, that in order to eat a sandwich, they had to wash their hands like a surgeon going into surgery. Honestly, they would have to wash their hands all the way up to their elbows. Every time they went to eat a meal, and it wasn't, it wasn't so much about them worrying about what they were taking into their body. It was more about them looking around to see who was, who was watching them wash their hands. It was religiosity. When you understand the culture of that day and you understand the traditions, the religious traditions that took place, most everything they did, they did by, so that they could get the praise of men. It was an outward thing so, so people could see it. We understand that when it's outward, it's the direct opposite of what God says because the scripture says man looks on the outward, but God looks at the heart. You see, we're, t- we're still talking about turning our heart to God. You see, it was all about an outward display. Everything they did, they prayed out loud. They squ- quoted scriptures out loud. They, everything, they, they, they wore certain things so people could see them. It was all about a show. It was all about religious display. That's what it was all about. That's why he has to say to them, he said, I'm not interested in what you're doing out here. It's not about tearing your clothes My God, get this. It's not about ripping your clothes. It's about tearing your heart. It's about surrendering your heart to God. The problem is your heart is far from me. You may look, you see, that's why he would say, you know, you look a certain way, but on the inside you're full of dead men's bones. You look religious, but you're not religious. You look like you're saved, but you ain't saved. You look like you know God, but you really don't know God. You look like something that you really don't possess. So what, so what he speaks out of, he speaks out of the understanding of the present culture. He speaks from the understanding of the religiosity that, go, that, that, that Jewish people live day to day. It's all about, look at me, look what I'm doing. He said, listen, you look like you got it, but you don't have it. That's why, that's why you would see examples like you see in Genesis chapter 37 verse 29. When the older brother of Joseph returns to the pit in which Joseph was dropped, he returns to that pit in Genesis 39 or 37, 29, and it says, Sometime later, Reuben returned to get Joseph out of the cistern. When he discovered that Joseph was missing, notice what he did. He tore his clothes. It, it, what was it? It wasn't something where he was really that passionate about it. He just began to do what is customary to do. 
You see, can I tell you something, ladies and gentlemen, the reason that we're getting the same results that we've gotten for the last 25 or 50 years is because we continue to do the same ritualistic thing that we've always done. Oh, oh, if, if I turn on the lights and I come to church and I sit on the pew and I sing the song and I put my $10 bill in the offering plate and I read my Bible every now and then and, and come on and I pray for my meal and, and the same prayer I've been praying since I was a kid. Good bread, good meat, good God, let's eat. Come on, somebody. I've been doing, if I continue to do those kind of things, then, 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 then that's, but that's where we are. That's what's gotten us into the place because we have this form of something that's, that's, that's really not there. You see, but God doesn't want some religious hypocritical, formal, hypocritical formality from us. He's not after the tearing of our clothes. He's after us dealing with our heart issues. The problem is we have a, prob, we have a heart issue. Our heart's somewhere else other than in God. Something else has our desires. Something else has our passion. But God, God doesn't want your hypocritical formality. That's why he says don't tear your clothes, but tear your heart instead. He's, you know, it was said even greater in the New Testament in Matthew chapter 15, verse 8. When he said this, he said, these honor me with their lips. They honor me by what they say. I can tell you church people have learned church lingo. We know how to say church stuff. We know how to be religious, talk religious, talk spiritual. Come on, somebody. When we want to get spiritual, we just switch over to the King James. That's when we want to get spiritual. We've learned the lingo. We've learned the talk. We honor God with our lips. We talk a good talk. We talk a good spiritual talk. But, but, but our heart's far from And he even goes deeper and says, their worship is a farce. For they teach man-made ideas as commands from God. See, that's what he's dealing with. You know, when, when he said, don't, don't rip your clothes, rip your heart, he said, I'm, I'm, I'm sick of all the ritualism. I'm sick of all that looks religious but, and looks spiritual, but it's not spiritual. I'm, I'm sick of you talking spiritual, but where is your heart? Where, how come you're not honoring me? How come somebody has to beg you to go to the house of God? Why does somebody have to beg you to give your tithe and offering? Why does somebody have to beg you to worship? You see, this is what I want you to understand. When you came to church today, you shouldn't have been waiting on somebody to lead you into the presence of God. When you got out of your car you should have swung the door open with a praise on your lips and a dance in your step you should have come in saying this is the day that the Lord hath made I'm going to rejoice and be glad in it don't patty cake if you're going to praise him praise him all over this house you should have came here today to honor God we've got what we got we're saying things with our lips but our hearts are far from God we're not we're not showing this thing you see here's where we are we find ourselves it's amazing how you can look at the word of God and watch the prophecies and the things told by the great prophets not just of the old testament but the greatest prophet of the new testament was that of the militant missionary apostle paul and he declared some things that would happen in the last days that we are watching unfold right before our eyes and some of the things that he declared was was not something against the world it was not it was not something brought charges that were brought against the world that's damning it's not the charges that he brought against people that don't love God but it's the charges that he said would happen he said in the last days they would have a form 2 Timothy 3, 3, 5 in the New Living Translation says it like this. It says they will act religious. They'll act it out. But they will reject the power that could make them godly. The problem is that's why we face all the immorality within the church and the problems that we have is that we have a form of godliness. We talk godly. We try to act godly. Huh? But we deny the power of God that causes a person to live godly. 
to be godly, to act godly, to walk out godliness, to have a passion and desire for God, to want to be in the presence of God. You have a form. You have something that looks like. You act religious, but you reject the power that makes you. And then he says, this is what Paul said, Timothy, stay away from people like that. They're dangerous. Religious people are dangerous. You beware of a guy that acts like he's got something he really don't have. Huh? You got to beware of a guy that acts like he know how to fight, but he can't fight. He'll help you get your butt whipped. Hello, somebody. Like I got this. And then when they start moving for you, he's pushing you up front. Huh? See, that's what's wrong. That's where we find ourselves. We think that's funny, but that's where we find ourselves. We have a form of godliness, but when we get in trouble, the form of godliness did not bring us to the place of godliness the form of godliness doesn't bring us to the place of godliness that produces the power to help you get through the situations that you're going through the reason we're powerless is because we have a form and we act like we got something that we don't have so the enemy and let me tell you something you ain't fooling the devil the devil knows whether you have it or you don't have it that's why he's messing the church up because we act like we got a gun and we ain't got a gun Crocodile Dundee walked up to that guy and he pulled out a switchblade. Crocodile Dundee reached in and put, he didn't just pull out something that looked like a knife. He said, that's not a knife, that's a knife. But see, here's the problem with most of us in the church. When the enemy pulls out the switchblade, the only thing we can do is pull out our fingernail clippers. That's the best thing we can pull out against the enemy because that's the only thing we have because we've only had a form of godliness. We don't know who God is because we've been away from God. We've been playing church. We we, we like to play rather than pray. We like to spend time with men rather than spend time with God. We like to do pleasurable things instead of being in the presence of God. But I'm calling out a church this morning. I'm calling out a people this morning that says I want God with everything that's in me. I want God. I want the presence of God. I want the power of God. I want to know him more. I want more of him. I desire more of him. I want to know him. I'm looking for somebody hungry. I'm looking for somebody thirsty. I'm looking for somebody like the, like David said. I'm looking for someone that's like a deer that panteth after the water brook. So let my soul thirst after you, O oh God. I'm looking for somebody that really wants God. Somebody that says, I, his presence is heaven to me. Somebody says, I want him more than anything else. See, can I tell you today? Don't don't lose the ifs and thens. Don't forget the if my people who are called by my name. You see, God takes, he takes the responsibility of revival out of the hands of the world and puts it back into the hands of God's people. When he says, if my people called by my name will humble themselves and pray. And seek what? My face. And turn from their wicked ways. It's our responsibility as a five-fold ministry. We've raised up a church that only knows how to seek the hand of God and not the face of God. Because everything we do is all about motivating somebody to be a better you. The problem is you. How can I motivate somebody to be a better you when the problem is you? We, we got all of these motivational preachers that want to help us build our own self-esteem. All they want to do is help us swell the pride that's already too big for God to be in, there, in place anyway. We've left no room for God because we're so full of ourselves. I preach Wednesday night. My God, I'm trying to quit. 
I preached Wednesday night this sermon. The sermon was this. The sermon was, you don't know what you've got until it's gone. Let me tell you something. The Bible says that David was a man after God's heart. As a young boy, you know he went to fight Goliath. But something interesting about that, as he went to fight Goliath, Saul tried to put his armor on him. And David said, no, take this armor off. I'm not going to take this with me. And he walks up to David. He says something. You've heard it said over and over again, but I want you to get it. He said, I didn't come with spear and a sword, but I came, what, in the name of the Lord. Because David knew God and walked in the anointing of God. He understood the close presence of God. And because of that, and then he went testifying of what his presence had already brought in his life. You see, a, a natural man cannot rip open the jaws of a lion. If I go into a fight with a lion, y'all, I'm going into the fight with not with a little gun. I'm going with a big gun and hope that the big gun works. But the Bible said David ripped open the jaws of a lion. He ripped open the jaws of a bear. How was he able to do that? Because the hand of the Lord was on him. Why was the hand of the Lord on him? Because he spent time in the presence of God. The anointing of God comes at a price. And the price is when you begin to love the presence of God more than you love anything else. Listen to me. David spends time with God. The anointing's on him when he... When he kills Goliath. The anointing is only when he goes into the, ha- the, the house of Saul. And the Bible says that he goes in and begins, they begin to look for somebody to pray so they can run the devils out of Saul's house. And they said, we got to find somebody that's a cunning player. We got to find somebody that's skillful. They found David, and this is what the Bible says about him. The Bible said David was cunning. He was a skillful player, but also the Lord was with him. What does that mean? He was anointed. You can play as good as you want to play. You can be as charismatic as you want to be. You can be as gifted as you want to be, honey. But what is missing in a lot of our lives is the hand of God on us, the anointing of the Holy Spirit. David later finds himself on the backside of a sheep field when they come to try to find a king in the house of Jesse. When they come to find a king in the house of Jesse, they parade every son in front of them and say, this must be the one. And the Bible says, that's not the one. That's not the one. That's not the one. That's not the one. All gifted, all talented, all with abilities, but that's not the one. He said, they said, you don't have another one? Well, I do have this other one. They brought him. The Bible says he was handsome. His eyes were beautiful. He was a handsome guy. But the difference was the Lord said, yep, that's the one. He was recognized not by the color of his eyes. He wasn't recognized by his beauty and his, that he was handsome. He was recognized because the hand of the Lord was on him. He was recognized because he walked in the anointing of God. Watch this. When they took him and they were going to they were going to insert him as king. The Bible said they poured oil on him. They poured oil on him. They anointed him. And the Bible says the power of God came on him. And David began to do what he had done all of his life. He began to experience and live in the very presence of God. Let me tell you something, honey. When you have lived in the presence of God... When you have walked close to God, I can tell you right now, they don't make no Mary J. Juana good enough to replace the presence of God. They don't make any kind of heroin, any kind of cocaine. They don't make no kind of drug. There ain't no sex. There ain't no sex. I ain't scared of you. There ain't no sex. That's good enough to replace the presence of God. Real softly, real softly, real softly, real softly. Let me prove it to you. Let me prove it to you. No sex good enough to replace the presence of God. David is king. A man who knew the presence of God, walked in the presence of God, but has found himself in a position that many of us in this room are in today. We've we've known the presence of God, but now we begin to take the presence of God for granted. 
When you read in its full context and in the context of, 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 of this passage of scripture, when David... is confronted by Nathan, the prophet, for his sin with Bathsheba. The Bible teaches us that where David was supposed to have been should have been on the battlefield with all the other, with those that he was king over. When the king gets arrogant and prideful, he'll leave his post. Y'all ain't hearing me. The Bible said that David went and he sent for Uriah to come from the battlefield and to lie with Bathsheba, Uriah's wife, so that David could hide the fact that he had been with her a few nights before. The reason he got with Bathsheba was because he, he was supposed to be in somewhere else, but his pride had him where he was. What? His pride put him in a position where he didn't feel like he had to do what God had anointed him to do anymore because he was the king. He had taken for granted the presence of God. And because he took for granted the presence of God, he was here when he should have been there. And because he was here, he saw a beautiful woman, a naked woman. And the lust began to rise up in him. Bathsheba must have been something else. She was showing up something, so much something that he said, somebody go get that woman. I got to have her. And they went and got her. And, and David laid down with her. And David impregnated her. Come on, somebody. David did that which was unseemly with her because it was not his wife. Are you listening to me, y'all? There are too many people selling out the anointing of God on their life for a little pleasure in the back seat of a car for 30 minutes. David sinned with her. But let me tell you what happens. David wakes up one morning shakes his head and says wait a minute real softly real softly watch this he wakes up one morning the man who the Bible says I seek him early he gets up this particular morning and he's going wait a minute I haven't felt him in a day or two. I don't feel him this morning. I call him, but I don't hear him answer. I cry out, but I don't feel what I used to feel. Some of you sitting in this room just like that right now. You cry out to God, but you don't feel him anymore. Some of you say, what's, somebody says, what's the difference in my child and me? Why is it that my, I don't see in my child what I, I saw in myself at that age? What is it about this generation? I can tell you what's wrong. The problem is, is we have a generation that hasn't felt him like you felt him. They haven't experienced him like you experienced him. We're raising a generation and we look at them and we blame it on them. And we say the reason that Blake doesn't feel the presence of God is because he wears holy jeans. He doesn't feel the presence of God because he wears these tight t-shirts. He doesn't feel the presence of God because he's got a funky hairstyle. And we point it at him, but the problem is not him. The problem is me. That's it. Amen. That's it. If he doesn't experience God like I experience God, it's because I didn't pay the price that my dad paid the price for for me to feel it. It's not their fault. It's our fault. We don't pray like we used to pray, y'all. We don't cry out like we used to cry out. 
We don't have all night prayer meetings anymore. You know why? Because we take it for granted that it's just going to be there. David woke up and he said, I don't feel you, God. I don't feel you anymore. You're not hearing the cry of a man who didn't know what it was to experience the presence of God. You're hearing the cry of a man who lived his whole life in the presence of God. Right now. And then all of a sudden it's gone. So the cry of David is not, Lord, please, please don't take my kingship from me. Please don't kick me out of the palace. Please don't take away all my expensive clothing and my servants. Please don't take my success from me. No, that's not at all what he's crying. You know what he cries? Lord, don't, please don't banish me from your presence. Don't banish me from your presence. Don't take your spirit from me. Take everything else, but God, restore unto me the joy of my salvation. Create in me a clean heart, O oh God, and renew a right spirit within me. I'm looking for about 50 people in this Pentecostal church today that will rise up and say, Lord, don't take me from your presence. Don't banish me from your presence. Don't take your spirit from me. Let me feel you. Let me feel you, Lord. Let me know you're there. I want to enjoy your presence. I want to get close to you, God. There's a lot of things out there today that'll take you from the presence of God if you'll let it. A lot of things that will rob you from knowing him in an intimate and a personal way if you let it. But I believe God's calling us today all over this church to a place of prayer. This is what I want you to do. I want you to stand all over the room. Sometime in the mid-80s, there was a Baptist preacher. He pastored a Baptist church called Beverly Hills Baptist Church somewhere in Texas. He was building a large church. People were coming, having all kind of activities to bring people. He's, you know, back then they were doing silly stuff, you know, he he said, I'd have church Sunday school campaigns and I'd, I would, what we would do is get these little bunnies and we would pin them on people's lapels as they were coming in church and we'd talk about hopping to Sunday school. Or we'd put a little banana on their lapel and say, come join the bunch. Just little things. And he said the church was growing and people were coming to church. The seats were filling. I was successful as far as numbers were concerned. But he said, I found myself in a position and a place where I wasn't experiencing God. And he said, there was something in me that caused me to cry out to God. And he said, one, one particular day I went to my study at home, I closed the door, and I went to prayer. And he said, I started calling out to God and crying out to God. As, as loud as I could cry and as hard as I could with everything in me, I was by myself. It was, and he said, I just, and he said, and I started to pray. And he said, before I knew what had happened good, I started that morning. And my wife came and knocked on the door and she said, honey, you might want to come out. It's lunchtime. I've got lunch made. He said, I'm not hungry. He said, I kept praying. He said, I kept praying and I was in the presence of God so long that it, was, it seemed like only a half hour when another knock came on the door and it was my wife again and she said, honey, you got to come out. It's supper time. I have supper ready. And he said, 
honey, I'm just not hungry. He said, before I, I knew what had happened, good. Another knock came on the door and it was my wife. And she said, honey, you've been in there all night long. I've got breakfast made. You got to eat. And he said, I'm not hungry. He said, this went on for two or three days until he said something came over me, the presence of God like I cannot explain came over me. And he said, all I could do was bawl like a baby. He said, I came out of the room bawling just like a baby, the presence of God. My face soaked with tears, just enjoying the presence of God. And he said, I went about the next several days just worshiping God, honoring God. He said, Sunday came, I went to church, went in and standing at the back door, shook hands, and all I could do was bawl like a baby, just crying. Went to the pulpit to preach and bawled like a baby. He said, that went on for a few weeks in my Baptist church when the deacon board got together. And they called me in for a meeting and they said, Pastor, we love you, man. We thank God for you, but man, you need a break. Something's wrong with you. He was just enjoying the presence of God. They said, something's wrong with you, man. We ra we've taken up a big offering. We raised enough money. We're going to send you and your wife on a two or three week vacation because, man, you're having a nervous breakdown. We gonna, we've raised all this money. We're going to send you. We want you to go take your money, take off, take as much time as you need. He said, because, Pastor, you are, you are having a breakdown, man. When they got through, he said, are you, are you guys through? Tears rolling down his face. Are you all through? They said, Pastor, you're sick. He said, are you all through? They said, yeah. He took his hands and slammed his hands down on the table. Looked at every deacon on that deacon board, eyeball to eyeball. And he said, I'm telling you this much. If I'm sick, I pray every person on this deacon board gets sick, just like I'm sick. Amen. Come on, come on, come on. And he said, you know what? Guess what? <laughs> every deacon on the deacon board got sick. The church members started getting sick with the same sickness I got. Revival broke out and that Southern Baptist church, hundreds of people started being baptized in the Holy Ghost. I'm praying for our church today to get sick. Sick in the presence of God. So this is going to be an unusual altar call today. Since you heard that story I just told you, many, many times I've come and given an altar call for people to come that are sick so we can pray for you. All right? Today's altar call is to come so you can get sick. Make us so Fill us, Lord, so with your presence and your power that everybody around us recognizes something's different. He ain't acting right. Make us sick today, God, in your very presence.